Welcome back to video two. Uh, we'll be focusing on this video on Hutchings' chapter on the slasher and post slasher. Uh, hopefully, we can move through this material somewhat quickly. Uh, there's a lot in this chapter, and there's a lot that we're going to be covering, so get ready. Uh, a key thing to think about with, uh, with slashers is that the their heyday was from the 1970s to the early 1980s. And uh, a key thing to keep in mind that a lot of the early, the 70s slashers were perhaps a little bit more socially engaged, uh, something that we talked about last week with the modern horror chapter. Uh, and when we get into the 80s, it becomes a lot more, uh, well, a lot less socially engaged and a lot more kind of fun and entertaining and lurid. Um, so keeping that in the back of your mind, we're going to go over some of the uh, conventions of the early slashers of the 1980s. Uh, one that's very obvious and something we've talked about with other horror films is that they were considered to be reactionary in their portrayal of women, particularly uh, women's sexuality. And, and consequently, they were often misogynistic. Uh, they kind of didn't show women in the best of terms, and there was an almost hatred of women uh, portrayed in the movies. And in the process, they also tended to reassert patriarchal norms. In this regard, they were reactionary compared to some of the modern horror films. Right? This is something that you definitely see in the 80s horror films and in some of the 70s horror films, but it is um, a, a fundamental way of distinguishing what are called modern horror films from the 1970s and the slasher and the post-slasher is slasher tend to have more blood and they also tend to be um, a lot more uh, misogynistic and patriarchal than the modern horror films. Um, a key other point that we've gone over all semester long as well is that there the whole idea of categorizing slashers is a difficult challenge um, they often went by other names the teeny kill pick uh, the stalker films and the women in danger films so it really is something that only later will critics actually formalize the name uh, slasher uh, according to one definition that um, i think is very instructive for our purposes here uh, in a way of helping us to find what a lot of the reactionary slasher movies were like, is that a psychotic individuals, usually a male, are pitted against one or more young people, usually females, whose looks, personalities, and or promiscuities serve to tr trigger recollections of some past trauma in the killer's mind. This is Stephen Scheider, and we can see this quote on Hutchings from 194. But this gives you a kind of formula of a kind of the reactionary element of the slasher, right? It, it literally does, um, in, in some ways, encapsulate, encapsulate it. Uh, nevertheless, you know, as as we've we've had two, you know, the two points that I've just made somewhat contradict each other. We have the fact that it's hard to define them, and then we have certain conventions that we see in them. And bearing that in mind, Hutchins uh, gives us some good good examples for helping us uh, identify some of the generalized qualities of slashers. All right, so again, this will be some repetition, but this repetition may be indicating a fundamental point to keep in mind for the midterm, a not too subtle hint. As already stated, a lot of the slashers are misogynistics. Another point, they focus on terrorizing the audience. It's the main point of a slasher. You go to a slasher not necessarily to think, but to, you know, uh, be utterly terrorized. This would be, you know, even potentially different from some of the ones we went over last time, like Dawn of the Dead, or even Last House on the Left, which uh, did kind of terrorize the audience, but also had some things that you could think about. Uh, not so in a lot of the horror films, like um, the Jason ones, uh, Friday the 13th. Um, which you know have some morality tales when you can you can think about them, but they're a little less complicated than um, than than certainly uh, Dawn of the Dead. Next point is also a very important point. Uh, these slashers also frequently emphasize the point of view of the killer. All right, this is a really you know this is a novel thing. Um, why do they do this, All right? They literally have us identify or inhabit the point of view of the killer. Why do they do this? 
first reason, so the killer, so the viewer can luridly identify with the killers, literally get inside their hand, heads and fulfill their sadistic pleasures. Okay, and this is a key, I think, like when we identify with the killer, we, uh, uh, in the process, kind of by extension, can feel like we're in their heads and this gives us some satisfaction. This is evoking an idea uh, from the Marquis de Sade, all right, Marquis de, the Marquis de Sade came up with the, the idea that people derive pleasure from causing pain to others or seeing others in pain. This is why we have this term sadism. It comes from the Marquis de Sade. And uh, one of the things that we can say about audiences is that uh, frequently many of the audience members do like to derive pleasure from watching others in pain. All right, or seeing how the the killer uh, kills you know do give 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 the victims pain and somehow identifying with that killer. So these these are uncomfortable positions to think about, but nevertheless they are part of the viewing experience of a horror film. Uh, and as we've gone over a few times, just remember the beginning of Halloween we saw in class from Michael Myers' perspective. This is a great you know we basically are are there while he kills, while Michael Myers kills his sister. And we only get the shock after the fact that we are in fact a six year old boy, uh, which is a kind of fascinating, fascinating thing. But in the process, we're just kind of along for the experience. Whether we're deriving pleasure from that, I don't know, but there's, you know, there, there is potentially something to think about there. Um, Another element of this is that while watching horror films, instead of identifying with the killer, you may identify with the victim and thus have a masochistic identification. Uh, and a masochist is somebody who finds pleasure in self-inflicted pain. Uh, this is also something that comes from literature um, by, by the um, author Werner von Masek, who wrote a book called Venus and Furs, which depicted a kind of early uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, people basically um, exploring uh, the, the pleasure-pain divide, and uh, hence the term masochism. But uh, this whole idea of suffering still being pleasurable is uh, something to think about, because when you go to a horror film, particularly if you are somebody who's easily scared, it may in fact be a, a challenging experience, not, definitely not a relaxing experience. And you may, in fact, um, be exhibiting, not that you're sitting there and, and that you, you know, are clinically a masochist, but exhibiting elements of masochism where there is a certain kind of pleasure in this discomfort or in this pain that you're experiencing. Um, another element that we can consider is that you might not identify with either the victim or killer. Going back to our discussion of audience last time, because that is, you know, fundamentally, um, we can't control how people react to things. Uh, but nevertheless, you may just derive pleasure in experiencing something unknowable or monstrous. This is a, a topic we've been going over all semester. Uh, it's, you know, a recurring theme from our discussion of monsters and our discussion of difference and so forth. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is there's also a certain suspense and fascination as you, you adopt the position of another being, even a psychotic one. Uh, this is just, you know, this is part of the whole filmic experience that where you can be transported into other people's lives. And it is perhaps one of the reasons why people keep coming back to films um, because it's a visual medium that allows you to uh, literally, you know, in, from the, not literally, but figuratively adopt the position of another. And this gets even more uh, challenging when we're encouraged to, to uh, adopt the position with a psychotic person. And it's just a key, a key idea to keep in mind um, that these are all different reasons why um, people may be uh, interested in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the slasher. And We've discussed how horror was directed at teenagers and positively portrayed them, particularly in relationship to their parents. Um, previous movies that flirted with horror fell into the juvenile delinquent narrative of the 1950s. Out of control kids are dangerous, so they must be forced to conform or be locked away or they are literal monsters. Okay, this is something that um, you know we saw with the modern horror at, at some level. 
um, where you just, you know, you, you, you have this violence directed at teenagers and you have people who are deriving pleasure from this violence, um, but we're not really sure, uh, uh, you know, why we're enjoying that. Um, and this is saying that horror films are really reiterating what was already kind of a, a, a genre, juvenile delinquent films of kids out of being out of control, which rather than the kids being kind of see, watching these movies and thinking, oh, I don't want to be like that, they were kind of like, oh, that's cool. If you are, if you've never seen the movie, uh, you've never seen this movie, but if you want to see a great example of a propaganda film from the 1950s that is kind of embodying the juvenile delinquent genre, um, let me encourage you to watch the movie Reefer Madness. Uh, this is openly an anti-pot movie. Um, produced in the 1950s, and it just depicts people who, once they start smoking pot, they become literally monstrous, and they become antisocial. So it has like lots of scenes with people, you know, going smoking smoking joints in the closet because they can't possibly interact with anybody else. And these movies were very, you know, you know, basically a, a say no to drugs kind of propaganda that um, the movie industry was producing, um, and you know, the moral of the story is that you would either become, go crazy if you continued doing pot or you'd end up going to jail. So you can see how this all fits very nicely with, um, you know, this, the, the, the ways in which um, the horror would pick up some of those themes. And meanwhile, people would go and watch these movies and poke fun of them. Like Reefer Madness is now a kind of cult classic if you don't know about it. It's not what you call a great movie, but it is perhaps a movie to start watching at midnight or, or, or in the wee hours of the morning uh, if you've been having a good night, out having a good night, uh, because it does kind of represent that desire, that the, the ways in which uh, trying to control desire makes people want to uh, have that desire, uh, or at least poke fun at it with something like Reaper Madness. So building on that, slashers really put forward a theme of death of, the, of teenagers, all right? In some films, think of Halloween, because of being a you know, prime example that we've talked about. Young people are being punished for being immoral and sexually active. Uh, if you recall in the movie, there's the, the key thing that happens is all the, all the uh, women find themselves in variously in scantily clad cotton windows with just their underwear and, um, you know, abandoning the children in order to potentially hook up with their partners. And this is supposed to, there's this kind of moralizing element to this. Um, and the teenagers are, uh, uh, you know, there's a kind of curious way in which teenagers are simultaneously identifying with these people, breaking the law, breaking the codes, and uh, trying to restore those codes. So um, to kind of put in that question, why did teenagers, the major, major audience for these films, take the light in these moralizing tales of teen existence? Okay, You'd think they would be much more critical of it. Uh, Robin Wood, again, offers a uh, a discussion of this when he says on youth audiences on page 199, the satisfaction that youth audiences get from these films is presumably twofold. They identify both with promiscuity and the grisly and excessive punishment. And this is kind of an interesting, an interesting kind of statement because it does show that uh, the way in which teenagers may be very uh, sexually uh, uh, interested or, you know, their hormones may be, in fact, asking them to be very uh, interested, but society is consistently telling them to uh, put a damper on that. And that is perhaps where the horror film uh, and the slasher um, is kind of filling in that that ambivalence, okay, that, that, that one where society says one thing, the teenager feels another thing and have to reconcile it. And both of these positions are put forward in the horror movie that way. Um, another key element that you may see, another theme you might see in the horror film and slasher are uh, emphasize how self-absorbed and inconsiderate teenagers are. The films moralize that the, the teenagers deserve punishment for this. They are punished for being self-absorbed and complacent. Again, you have to ask yourselves, you know, why is that, you know, why is that a theme? And I don't really have a, a good answer for you, but it's just uh, uh, the they're, they're the moralizing strand is that uh, uh, if teenagers are self-absorbed, which teenagers tend to be, 
uh, this is not viewed as something of where the, of discover, you know, not as a positive thing of discovery, but something to be corrected. Uh, and therefore, uh, those who are too self-absorbed should be punished. So interestingly enough, it almost serves a, an ideological function of trying to normalize teen behavior. Uh, another theme that we could consider is how teenagers are guilty for some real or imagined crime in the past that they were directly involved in, or they are innocents who must pay the price for the past indiscretions of people in the community. Um, with the latter, uh, we can really think of that, you know, that discussion we've had with the return of the repressed and the Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street, where all the teenagers who are falling asleep and being killed because their parents um, lynched. Uh, Freddy Krueger, that's a great example of that. You know, basically the past indiscretions of the community are being now enacted on the, uh, on the, on the community. A movie like Scream kind of plays this out too, or the, the idea is that the parents' indiscretions are now being played out on uh, the main character, Sydney. Um, or just, uh, you know, something like the, uh, like uh, Friday the 13th, where the teenagers uh, have to pay um, because of uh, Jason Forhey's death. So the mother is taking it out on, on later teenagers, being an example of the first one. Um, we can look at all these moralizing uh, elements or, or elements of flashers and themes that we could consider, but um, a more generous reading that Hutchins puts forward, which I tend to also think maybe something. I mean, all of these things are at work. It's not like one's better than the other. These are these are kind of guides for helping us look at themes in movies rather than necessarily saying this is the way they should be. Um, but a more generous kind of way of looking at horror films is that they have a moral to them. Uh, take care and be aware of your surroundings because it's a scary world out there and bad things can happen. This is kind of the watch out reading uh, so that we can look at horror films as uh, examples of, uh, you know, how by, by the fact that all kinds of terrible things can happen to us seemingly in safe spaces, um, they may provide guides to help us uh, adapt to a uh, often hostile and ever-changing world. So this is just kind of, you know, just another way of considering these ideas. A central idea that um, is tremendously important to uh, the slasher and to sla and to critic criticism on the slasher and the horror film is the idea of the final girl. Okay, this is an idea that Carol Clover put forward, and we'll be reading her essay in a few weeks as well. But um, here are some of the main themes of it, uh, just to give you a sense. Clover, if you recall from a few weeks ago when we were discussing the uh, the chapter on difference is a figure who tried to um, you know, move us away from discussions of you know, psycho psychoanalytic readings by like Mal Laura Mulvey, whereby uh, there was no female position. There was no a position for a female viewer to a horror film okay, because of their overarching misogyny and patriarchy. Uh, this is something that, as we talked about, Linda Williams started to question in her book. And Clover kind of takes it to the next level. And uh, she is considering slashers, which, as we've already talked about, do have oftentimes misogynistic and patriarchal qualities and tries to read them against the grain. Um, and, and so one of the key things she identifies is the final girl. And, and the final girl kind of upends or disturbs this idea that all slashers and uh, and horror films are merely misogynistic. Uh, what are final girls? Here are some of their qualities. Final girls are heroic women who survive the killer. Okay, a key example would be, of course, in Halloween, um, you know, the main lead, the Jamie Lee Curtis character, she's able to survive. Um, they survive the killer. They're also successful at killing the killers. Okay. Everybody else, not so much, but the final girl is the final girl. She survives. All the men get killed off. All the kind of uh, uh, other women that are somehow not as morally superior may, may die as well. Another thing that we see with the final girl is it shows how identity, identities are socially constructed and performed. This is getting back to that idea that we've been talking about um, with difference and what we we're talking about with the audience. 
um, and the performance of gender, um, if we just think about how identities are socially constructed and performed, we get a sense that male and female identities can switch. Uh, and the, the, the central thing to keep in mind is that the viewer, going back to audience, the viewer can identify with a female, you know, a male viewer can identify with a female and a female viewer can identify with a male viewer. And this is kind of a, a central idea for Clover, kind of trying to say it's a little more complicated. Your gender does not determine how you will uh, view a film. And so the final girl may show the very same masculine approaches of aggression or violence as the killer in order to outsmart him or use even more violence than the killer. Okay, this is just a key thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, the final girl may turn the tables on the killer and in the process avoid the violence of the killer by engaging in more violence, okay, just to restate the same model same term. Clover uses the term boyish, you know, to basically says that final girls act, act boyish, right? So this is kind of, kind of saying that there's a, a performance of gender for the final girl. Uh, a key other element of the final girl is asked to view the viewer to further question the social construction of masculinity and femininity, which are, of course, these social constructions. Uh, so we, again, are kind of getting back to what I've just said, uh, having to recognize that these, these categories of masculine and femininity are produced and they're much more fluid and flexible than we may initially think, all right? And the final girl problematizes any fixed way of thinking of masculinity and femininity. Okay, final girls are also marked very differently in the movies. They may wear different clothes. They're less revealing. They exhibit, as mentioned above, stereotypically masculine attitudes, right? And so we can just, um, going back to Halloween, think of the Jamie Lee Curtis character. Her clothes are never revealing. Uh, she is always covered head to toe. She's taking care of the kids. Uh, and in the process, this is, uh, uh, you know, she is not reduced to the objecthood of women. She's not fetishized as an object to be viewed by the man you know, like Mar Laura Maldi said. And in the process, she's uh, in the process, perhaps looks more masculine and therefore acts more masculine and is able to vanquish the killer, right? And so this is uh, all to say that uh, the, there's kind of subtle clues that may be placed in the movie that will indicate uh, who the final girl might be before the movie fully unfolds. So you can, recognize some of these attributes, you may be able to determine who the final girl will be well before the film ends. Um, another key thing is by kind of, you know, having the final girl engage in more uh, violence, um, she may be the agent of the final expression of terror and shock. Because as we know, slashers use the violence as the primary means of, of shocking the audience. Okay, that's why in, you know, in slashers, you have people being disemboweled, you have um, you know, something like Leatherface, you never see his face and he's just like a, basically a killing machine. Uh, and this kind of the anonymity makes him somehow more, more horrific. Uh, and, and meanwhile, when we look at uh, Sally in the movie, she kind of represents the final girl. She's able to get away. She's the one that gets away, although we have to wonder what kind of mental state she's in uh, at the end. Um, she doesn't really engage in all that much uh, violence against anybody, except seemingly to herself, but it does kind of, uh, you know, problematize the idea that she is a, a pure victim in this. Okay. Um, Hutchings then goes at length to discuss another kind of um, uh, category, right? Again, these are all categories to try and define movies, going back to you know, the central premise of our class and the central topic that we keep talking about, that uh, these categories are kind of meant to kind of give us signposts rather than to be um, you know, all-encompassing. So. Um, one such category is the post-slasher, 
All right. And how do you recognize when you're in a post slasher? Well, it's sometimes, you know, it's oftentimes you're in a movie after the, you know, post 1980s, because a lot of times the post slashers are relying on the previous slasher. So what you'll see with, uh, you know, a way of marking post slashers is the serial seriality of horrors. Uh, and you have a focus on sequels and on the return of early characters produced in the slasher. All right. So that's why you have, you know, many, many Friday the 13th, many, many, many Halloweens. All right. Uh, and why you will uh, even see, um, you know, you know, urban legends one through whatever and uh, saws one through or whatever. These are all kind of examples of, uh, of, of serials. And whenever you have multiple multiple uh, productions of the same general film, you are immersed in the post slasher and you're really looking at movie franchises and sequels. All right. The movie franchise is, you know, the Halloween franchise, the Friday the 13th franchise, and all of them become their own thing, even if sometimes some of the main characters don't even appear. All right. It's just, a, it, it's kind of gone to a totally different realm. As, as you may notice if you've ever seen Halloween 3. Um, while we're looking at post slashers, you know, this is oftentimes put forward as that point where, uh, you know, when you have serials or you have sequels, that, that people have run out of new ideas. Um, you know, there may be some element to that, but I think it really does neglect the fact that most of these decisions to create sequels and serials are uh, directed by market forces trying to follow a tried and true formula with an established audience. If you have people that are already know that Halloween was good, they're going to come to see Halloween too, much like you see with all the Star Wars films. Uh, and so rather than kind of uh, think of this as an idea, a, a situation where because we have sequels, because people are too stupid to come up with new ideas, perhaps the way to kind of consider it is that market forces are now directing uh, the possibilities of, of what can be made, right? which is, I think, much closer to the truth. Uh, there's plenty of ideas out there. They just don't see the light of day because of uh, market forces, because they, they can't necessarily prove that they're going to make money. Excuse me. Um, a key thing to think about of why there are serials, much like we talked about, why do people keep going back to horror films, um, even though we know a lot of the conventions already? And the, the answer is there's considerable fun in seeing the reimagining of these movies as new characters do crazy things or previously dispossessed characters act vastly more powerful, sometimes to admittedly ridiculous portions. All right. And this is just this idea of seeing, uh, you know, um, you know, a character that... <clears throat> Uh, you know, was weak in one movie, now all of a sudden become tremendously powerful. Or, you know, the fact that the Friday the 13th franchise, it starts off, you know, you think that you're, you're surprised to learn that, in fact, it's not a man killing any of the, killing, killing all those teenagers at the camp, but in fact, uh, the mother of Jason Voorhees, but at the end of that movie, Jason Voorhees comes, seemingly comes to life. We're not sure if it's a dream or not, but that then ushers in the next Friday the 13th, where Jason Voorhees is wreaking his havoc uh, at Crystal Lake and many other places from then on. Okay, so those are some basic elements of the post slasher. A key thing to keep in mind of the post slasher, it's a way of describing sequels and serials and franchises. Um, a later genre, and this is kind of getting us to the end of where uh, Hutchings' book is covering because just of when it's written uh, is what's called the postmodern slashers of the 1990s all right and we'll talk you know I, I just kind of plant this seed and we'll talk more about it in just a bit a great example of that is the scream movies all right because they are they are they are they could be examples of the postmodern and you know you may have heard the term postmodern it's basically the after the modern era and given that we the previous chapter to this was the mod, you know, the basically discussing uh, modern horror films. So um, we would then eventually reach a point where people would want to be talking about postmodern horror films. But this is an intellectual idea that was very big in academia uh, in the 
starting in the 1980s, kind of late 70s, 1980s, and then really coming into its own and dominating in the 1990s. So it's kind of an interesting thing that um, some of these academic ideas were actually, um, you know, being taken up by the by pop culture. Um, but just to kind of give you a, a coherent, this is this postmodernism is something that was meant to describe all of culture. So there was a sense that there was something called postmodern literature, there was postmodern architecture, uh, there was postmodern film, and there was um, post you know postmodern photography. It just this whole sense that the modern or the industrial era was changing, and there was a new kind of artwork being being made due to changes in. Um, in, in, in the economy and the, the focus on televisual technology. Postmodernism is often uh, associated with television and, 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 um, um, and filmic and film kind of coming to prominence and the loss of print uh, uh, culture as kind of the dominant mode of transmission of knowledge and for um, creating new knowledge. So, just to read you what's already up here, postmodernism is an intellectual idea to try and explain a historical reality in the U.S. and Europe where financial capital and televisual technologies dominate. Right? Financial capital is um, basically the, a, a different way of thinking of the economy. Um, what we used to have at one point was something which we still have in certain parts. It's called industrial capitalism. Industrial capitalism is when you have industries that actually produce things, all right, and that and the production of objects is then a form of value that is put out in the open market and, and people would be simultaneously making these objects, earning money, and then being able to buy these objects. With financial capital, we consistently see um, primarily banks and hedge funds and equity firms uh, uh, buying companies and hoarding them for their value, trying to extract value from them, whether they make a product or not. Okay, so this is this is a great example of this that's maybe, you know, that, that's close to home for some of you is if you've ever heard of the toy store Toys R Us, uh, it was a toy store, it was a big kind of uh, chain of toy stores that would warehouse tons and tons of, uh, of toys. Um, but then it was bought by an equity firm or a hedge fund, I can't remember which, and the the primary way that the uh, you know the company was trying to make money for this hedge fund and equity firm was to take on debt based on the assets of the toy store franchise. Well, as the toy store wasn't bringing in the revenue that it was, the debts that the equity firm had brought up against the uh, the franchise meant that they had to sell, sell, sell and close Toys R Us. So that's why it doesn't exist. It wasn't that there wasn't demand for people buying the toys. It just their demand wasn't reaching the debts that had been created so that the people who had invested in this uh, company could get their returns. All right. So it's a kind of, it is, as, I, as I hope you can understand, it sounds rather abstract. And the fact of the matter is, it is. But it is one of the dominant ways in which wealth is now transmitted in our contemporary economy. And we're kind of dealing with a lot of that, that um, reality. But as I'm describing it, you may get a sense that it's very hard to feel like there's anything tangible, all right? Because when you're just kind of making value out of asset, you know, taking toy stores and turning them into debt and then turning that into assets, it all seems very kind of, it's basically money being thrown at money. And that's in fact what's happening. And that's what was also then kind of seen as a crucial element of the postmodern era, right? It's also just a kind of moment when you start seeing, as I mentioned earlier, more and more televisual technologies uh, dominate. Um, with this kind of dominance of financial capitalism and with televisual technologies, I mean, think think of TV, but now your smartphone. Just think about how that may have that may have changed your life over the course of the last five to seven years. Um, just as a very kind of direct example. Um, these technologies therefore altered how we understand reality, knowledge, because knowledge helps create our understanding of reality and culture. And so that's why um, you know, these economic effects and these technological productions are having dramatic effects in our, our notions of culture and society. 
a couple of ideas of postmodernism that all cultural production draws on and refers to previous forms of cultural production and incorporates them. This is called, idea is called pastiche. Pastiche is the bringing different disconnected elements together. So a great example of postmodernism that, that was frequently described in architecture is how you would have elements of a medieval castle incorporated with um, a modern building. And basically you'd have two different historical periods uh, coexisting within one building. And that would be a, a marker of, uh, of pastiche, that there, you know, there wasn't a, a kind of coherent historical reality being reflected by the time, but a drawing on previous historical forms of a kind of modern sleek box and uh, the spires from medieval castle being brought together, suggesting that um, the postmodern was merely drawing on them and bringing them together in novel ways. Another idea that you see is that we live purely through screens and representations that stand in for reality. All right, this is uh, a, both an easy and a hard idea. Just think about how often you interface with your smartphone and how the smartphone may interface my, your reality and how you communicate with people. Do you talk with people face to face or do you in fact uh, text them even if they're in the same building or apartment as you are? And that's a kind of interesting comment that we feel as comfortable with a screen as we would with other people, or we feel more comfortable with a screen than we do with other people because it's easier to communicate unilaterally with a screen than to actually have to deal with other people. Uh, that's simultaneously perhaps a reassuring and perhaps a terrifying thought, just as something to think about. As a result, we struggle to see a difference between reality and images on screens. When you are on your smartphone, you live the screen as if the person was there. Just kind of reiterating what I was, what I was saying. And this is, this is a fundamental element of, of what we might call postmodern reality for our contemporary moment. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that cu cultural production often refers to itself in a mocking or ironic way. Okay, there's a, one of the things that you'll see is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of irony or a lot of ways in which people are drawing from previous previous cultural elements and looking at it and poking fun at it. And uh, horror films would do this as well. And so we see uh, a great example of a postmodern slasher are the horror films that were self-reflexive, which is to say they're horror films or slasher movies that comment on slashers and horror movies, right? And that's, so you, you know, a great example is the movie Scream by the great horror director, Wes Craven. All right, Wes Craven did The Last House on the Left, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, and um, he also did Scream, which if you've not seen Scream, you should really run out and see it, but it's a horror film that's drawing on all the previous conventions of horror films and kind of doing it to poke fun at the horror films, all right? And so um, uh, to kind of, point this out to you. Let's go ahead and watch this clip from, uh, from. Okay. Um, right now I'd like to be showing you the clip from Scream and you can see the, um, the link that I would ask you to, to go to. And in fact, what I will do is I will make these links available. Uh, so what I'm going to do is speak to you about them because when I actually play these links, um, there is no sound, so we I, it doesn't really serve our purposes. So you can watch the action on the clink, but not hear the actual dialogue between the characters, and therefore isn't really going to help us. So I'll just frame this uh, this clip and then ask you to watch it on your own time, and then I'll be doing the same for another clip from Scream Two. Um, but uh, this is a clip from the movie Scream, directed by. Uh, Wes Craven, you know, one of the horror masters, Last House on the Left, Nightmare on Elm Street, and his 1996 film Scream. And um, this is a clip that takes place in a video store. This is a moment in the 1990s when video stores are really kind of spaces where people congregate. People would go on Friday and Saturday evenings uh, in preparation for the night and get the videos and then they'd all hang out together. So this is not an unrealistic scene that you would see everybody in your town uh, potentially at the video store. And while we're there, we're going to have one of the characters played by Jenny and Kennedy um, named Randy describing 
uh, how the real life events are borrowing from a movie called Prom Night. And here he is, he's a movie, you know, he's a movie buff, a horror movie buff. And while he's there, he's talking to two guys. And if you've seen this movie, you understand that the two guys have a very important role in the movie. In fact, they may have the most important role. And everything in this scene is actually a clue for about what will happen later on in the movie. Uh, and uh, this dialogue, the, the, the end of it is everyone is a, susp a suspect, which is you know, technically uh, the line that is played throughout the entire movie, uh, basically the line of thought and the, the line ultimately that everybody is following throughout the movie. And um, our two suspects may in fact be right in front of us. And um, <clears throat> you'll also note at the beginning of the whole clip is that there's an excerpt from um, James Whale's 1931 Frankenstein. And so this is kind of a, a, a commentary on horror films. It's alive, it's alive. And here we have a uh, example of a postmodern slasher commenting on horror films and talking about how the horror film genre itself is constantly being reinvented. So please watch this. If you've never seen Scream, it's a great movie. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, just note that the the central premises is this woman named Sydney, and her boyfriend is one of the characters in the scene you're going to see. And uh, she is being stalked by a masked killer. And uh, this is a very kind of wealthy suburb. This kind of stuff doesn't happen. There's some sense that uh, something happened with the parents for which the kids may be paying for, you know, paying, paying the price. All these kind of uh, elements of the horror and slasher are kind of being played out in, in very small form. And uh, this scene is really the culmination. And then if you were to watch the entire movie, a lot of the people, um, a lot of people are killed and the killers are revealed at the end. And some of the things that the uh, Randy character is speaking about in the video, including a father potentially coming back at the end of the movie, uh, perhaps that is realized. I don't want to give away everything, but um, uh, it is... There are all these clues in this scene, and if you um, if you haven't watched the film, you may want to watch it again. Um, the next clip I want to draw your attention to is uh, Scream Two, okay? And this is um, an idea. You know, Scream Two is a sequel for Scream, and so therefore, it, it the clip that I would be I'd show you right now is you know, basically articulating how sequels to movies suck. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting moment. I guess it's a high school film class. It's probably the best film class you know, uh, I've ever seen. Uh, uh, and you would probably like, prefer to be in that film class rather than our own. Um, thankfully, thankfully, it's just a Hollywood version of a film class. I, I would love to have that kind of conversation. Uh, but um, the whole premise of this is that sequels suck. And this is being portrayed, you know, being put forward in a sequel, all right? So it's Scream 2, which is a sequel, commenting on the sequel. So this kind of really speaks to um, what is in postmodernism, the meta quality, where everything is kind of speaking to everything else. And uh, every element of this movie is drawing from previous elements and commenting on them either kind of ironically or at least acknowledging them. Uh, and so these two, you know, please watch the Scream 2 clip because it goes through all these different sequels and trying to argue whether there is a good sequel or a sequel that was better than the first. And um, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen. And just so you know, there's an end part in the scene where the Randy character is, um, you know, if, 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 if he could write his own sequel, the geek would get the girl. Just note that in the first Scream, he kept wanting Sydney, the... the uh, the protagonist, and in the second one, he still wants her, and you have to watch the entire Scream 2 to see if, in fact, that that works out for him. Um, all of you know, just to end our our discussion and to kind of bring bring this to a, a close, um, this this element of the post slasher, uh, you know, this the, you know this comment that sequels suck is a comment on post slashers, and uh, you know. 
uh, made by many of the 1990s film critics. And this is also when Scream is being made and when Scream 2 is being made. That said, uh, you know, now that we have these references to the slasher, the post slasher, and the postmodern slasher, and the postmodern slasher and the uh, post slasher are really focused on the 1990s. Um, a key thing to just keep in mind, particularly when we get into an, an international scope, is that horror films from the 1990s are varied and may not fit into the postmodern category. Okay, that's the end of video number two. Thanks for your time and patience. Uh, I'm having some technical difficulties and may not be able to complete number three. Uh, so I will be in touch with you about that. It may, in fact, be present on Monday. Thanks very much.